Okay, our forum runs from 8.30 to 9.45, and each time we'll pause for announcements. We always begin with the prayer. Jackie, can you give us a prayer this morning? Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And that you brought us to where we are today. We ask that as Sarah seeks and forth, it's for today that we bless and that knowledge will be imparted. We thank you for the so many blessings in the name of the Sun Coming King. Amen. Amen. Okay. I don't think we have any first time with you today. No first time. Okay, I want um, you to know, Dr. May, that we have a large virtual audience and we have few people that come in and out, but we have a large virtual audience, so you're, you're talking to a lot of people, okay? It's okay. And you're used to that. But our guest today is Dr. Monique May. She is a physician, a family physician. She's also an author, and she is the founder of Physician in the Kitchen. And she's here today to talk about uh, the benefits of a, a plant-based diet, which I need just as much as all of us in this room. That's right. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm going to let you go ahead and give your presentation. Okay. And then we'll have questions from the audience. And also, questions may come in um, by text message to us. Okay. Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Good morning. Good morning. The body's good. Okay. Oh, so, excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. I forgot. She has to leave at 9 30 today. So we're going to. Um, let her give her presentation, and then we'll ask questions until it's time for the week. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me. I love coming before people and talking about food and their health. So we're going to try to keep stay on schedule. Uh, but my name, as she mentioned, is Dr. Monique May. I'm a board certified family physician, and my brand is Physician in the Kitchen. And I help busy households enjoy healthy plant-based eating without impacting their hectic schedules. So we're going to get started with the talk today, which is Eat the Rainbow, the Benefits of a Plant-Based Diet. Next slide. So before we get started, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and why you should listen to me. As she mentioned, I'm a board certified family physician for 23 years. I'm a two-time best-selling author. Those are my two books there. And I've worked with Mecklenburg County Health Department as a medical consultant. Um, I was um, named Physician of the Year in 2019. I have been a print and media, uh, print and TV media contributor, and I've worked as a medical director for the past 10 years. Um, I graduated a long time ago in the top 10% of my medical school class, and then was later named Outstanding Resident of the Year. I've served as a brand affiliate for Denny's Restaurants, Nutter, and Saratoga Olive Oil Company, and I've hosted various online shows, including Veganish and uh, a series of online cooking classes. Next. I'm a former adjunct prof professor of family medicine at UNC Chapel Hill here in Charlotte. As I mentioned, I'm the founder of the brand Physician in the Kitchen. I've also created a vegan researcher sauce. Be on the lookout for that. It's coming soon to a store near you. And I have over 7,000 social media and email subscribers. I trained at a vegan culinary school, and I am a paid blogger. Next slide. All right, so let's get to why we're here today. So the United States um, spends on health care. Oh, I'm sorry. What we spent on health care grew 2.7% in 2021, reaching over $4 trillion dollars or $12,900 per person. The next country after us that compares is Germany, and they spent just over $7,000 per person. So there's a huge gap on what we're spending in, on healthcare in the United States versus the next country. And as a share of our GDP, oh, that's fine, you have to cry. But as a share of our GDP or gross domestic, um, excuse me, um, what is it? The, uh, what is GDP? Gross. Domestic domestic product. Product. Thank you. <laughs> we spend it's about 20%, almost 20% of what we spend of all um, products and services made in this country goes toward healthcare. So that's pretty expensive. So we're going to look now by diseases and see where that money is going. So the top five causes of death for, uh, for adults in this country 
And these numbers are as of 2021. Heart disease claimed almost 700,000 lives. Cancer, just over 600,000. COVID-19, of course, over 400,000. Accidental injuries, 225,000. And stroke, 163,000 almost. Next slide, please. So let's look at heart disease. So all of this data I'm going to share with you is coming from the American Heart Association. Heart disease is the leading cause of death for men and women across all racial and ethnic groups in the United States. One person dies every 34 seconds. So every minute, two people die from cardiovascular disease. And almost 700,000 people in the U.S. died in 2020 from heart disease. So that's one out of five deaths was due to heart disease. In 2019, the last year I could find numbers for, African Americans were 30% more likely to die from heart disease than Caucasians. And African American adults are more likely to have high blood pressure, which is a, a risk factor that we'll get to a little later. And they're also less likely to have their blood pressure well controlled. Let's look at strokes. So on average in the US, someone dies of a stroke every three, almost three and a half minutes. Over 400 deaths are attributed to stroke every day in this country based on data from 2020. And these numbers don't even include the disability that people who have strokes and survive go on to have difficulty speaking, difficulty with mobility, and so forth. Next, let's look, let's look at cancer, because that was on that list that we have. So on the, based on the American Cancer Society from 2022, the leading cause of death from cancer in women was lung and bronchus. Bronchus are the big tubes in your, in your lungs, the big airways. Breast was second, and colorectal cancer was third. When we look at men on the next slide, very similar numbers, but swap out breast for prostate. Okay? Next slide. So as we mentioned, cancer is the second most common cause of death in, the, in this country. Um, second only to heart disease, and over 224,000 new cancer cases and over 70,000 cancer deaths are projected to have occurred in African Americans last year. We have the highest death rate and the shortest survival of any racial group in the United States for most cancers. And for example, African American women are 40% more likely to die from breast cancer, even though white women are actually diagnosed more with it. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Access, you know, beginning diagnosed later when the cancer is more advanced and so forth. Now we'll look at obesity. Because as we, we all know, it's kind of hard not to, to be aware obesity is, is an epidemic in this country at this point. So for the past three years, or for the data from 2017 to 2020 rather, approximately 42% of Americans were obese. During that same time span, the obesity rates also increased 42%, and the severe obesity rates doubled. They went from about 4.5% to almost 9 So when we look at obesity, the conditions that tend to be related or associated with that are heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and even certain types of cancer. And again, African Americans, and particularly women, have the highest rates of obesity or being overweight compared with their um, non-African American um, counterparts in this society. And last count, over 80% of African American women were overweight. So this is a, just a, a, a numbers listing here to show you what, when we say body mass index, what we mean, uh, or BMI for short. Keep in mind though, this is a rough guide, okay? So in other words, this is not gonna be as accurate for someone who is very muscular, someone, uh, maybe even the elderly, people who have, you know, different health conditions. BMI is a very rough tool that we use to, to tell you where you should be for your weight, for your height. So underweight is considered a BMI of less than 18.5. A healthy or normal weight is between 18 and a half to 24.9. Overweight is 25 to 29.9. Obese is 30 to 39.9, and extremely obese is over 40. So now let's look at diabetes, because that's one of those conditions that often goes hand in hand with obesity. So again, from 2017 to 2020, 
Almost 10 million people, adults, were undiagnosed with having diabetes. Almost 30 million were diagnosed, but almost that bottom number to me is, is very, is even more concerning. 115 million have pre-diabetes. This is the, the group where if some changes, even small changes are made, you can prevent diabetes from developing. And that's a huge number. And that's where we can have a lot of impact preventing the disease before it actually begins. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit later. And lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about Alzheimer's because more than 6 million people, uh, Americans um, of all ages have Alzheimer's. Typically we see an age over you know, 65, but you can be diagnosed younger. And that number is only projected to grow by 2050. We know that there are studies that look at racial and ethnic disparities. And again, they, they tend to show higher rates of dementia in African-American adults. Next slide. So now let's look at some of the risk factors for, the, for these illnesses and conditions. We've talked about the common ones. What increases one's risk for developing these conditions? And you're gonna see some overlap here. You're gonna see some repeating things, but the risk factors for heart disease and stroke, high blood pressure, the high levels of the bad cholesterol, LDL, diabetes, smoking, even secondhand smoke, being in a house with someone who smokes, being overweight, not eating the best foods, not being physically active, and African-American race. Next slide, please. Some of these are going to show up on that list for cancer. Cigarette smoking, excessive body weight, drinking alcohol, um, UV radiation, excessive sunlight can, can do it. Physical inactivity and poor diet. For example, we know that colon cancer risk is increased if you have a diet that's high in processed foods, for example. I think we skipped Alzheimer's. Yep, thank you. So risk factors for Alzheimer's are age, family history, the histories of head injuries can increase your risk for dementia, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, cholesterol, and high blood pressure. And those are all kind of lumped together because those uh, conditions increase the injury to blood vessels, they cause inflammation, and that is a, a, about to be an underlying process in the development of Alzheimer's. And then lastly, we see African-American race. So I just want to pause for a second because I don't like to just talk at people. Do we have any questions? I'd like to ask a few questions. Okay, I will, I will do the questions, okay? Oh, okay. Okay, do we have any questions at this point before she moves on to the next? Okay, Ken and then Natalie. I, I noticed in there the African-American race. Uh, how much of it actually does race play versus people's habits and lifestyles? Because it kind of frustrates me a little bit when I see everything saying, well, black Americans are more uh, we inclined to do more crazy stuff, like I'm having a hammer right now. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you called yourself out, not enough to do it. But no, but you, you raise a very good point. It's, there are some things that are inherent to just the being of African descent. But yes, lifestyle, half of the things I mentioned, oh. diet, exercise, smoking, right? That's no matter what color you are, those are things that you probably should or shouldn't be doing, depending on what we're talking about. So those intricacies can be very delicate, can be very difficult to tease apart sometimes because they can be so intertwined. Um, and there are studies always kind of looking at that. But even when you take things into consideration, say, for example, um, uh, when you look at levels of education and, and income for black women, maternity rates or death rates are still higher than compared to white women. Look at Serena Williams and the complications she had after her pregnancy. So even when you take those things into account, there still is something going on. And so that's a great question that I don't know that I have the full answer to, but they're definitely doing research into it. <laughs> Nathalie. I was surprised that you listed the risk factors for Alzheimer's. I thought they kind of don't know what, why some people get it and some people don't. No. And uh, what? That we don't know. That's, that's the research and evidence has evolved over years. We, we, do, we have an idea of why people get Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, 
Winston and then Jackie, and then we're going to move on to her second part of her presentation. So yeah, just to kind of follow up to the, the theory of what Ken asked, um, it seems like, let me set this up. My wife and I traveled the first three years of our marriage uh, before we had children and wanted to go see the world. We went to 17 countries. And what we found was food ways are way more finite than we originally thought. Uh, we all eat the same 15, 20 animals, carbs, and, and have a plant-based diet. Yet, again, uh, there's so much pathology in black food ways that we see these associations with health when we don't see them in other areas. For example, again, I, when we went to Southeast Asia, I've never seen people eat more entrails, you know, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Black people eat chitlins twice a year, killing ourselves. Uh, while grits is deemed slave food, polenta is a Spanish and Italian national uh, delicacy. It's the exact same thing. So where does pathology play with these food, black food ways, and how does just simply the stress of being black in America, those social factors, weigh on the outcome of these results that, you know, because again, we all, we pretty much eat the same thing. My, my day job was in marketing. I had to travel the country extensively. And I've been to places where there are no black people in two or three counties, in a two or three county span. Yet what there is is a thriving fast food network circuit. So again, this, you know, we're 12% of the population. This is a thriving industry. How are all of these systems supported, yet we get the front of the association with soul food being just killing us as opposed to, you know, as finite as it is, as a food way. Yeah, I think that's just part of it, though. I mean, you, you make a good point. It's how food is prepared when we talk about processed foods. Uh, or uh, processed meats being a risk factor for colon cancer, the way food is prepared, um, how food is eaten, you know, relation to exercise. These are all things that have to be taken into consideration. You mentioned fast foods. You know, if you're eating fast foods more than a certain sure. times a week, no, number of times a week, those all things all come into account. We're going to stick to more for a plant-based diet during this talk, but those are great questions and points that you bring up. Oh, Jackie, and then... Uh, we're going to move on to the mm -hmm. second part of her presentation. Because maybe some of what I say will answer some of those questions. And also, Winston, people in those countries walk everywhere. Oh, no. Everywhere. It's the version of Charlotte everywhere. Like, it's, I know that's the, the I mean, ideology, but, you know, no, but they, people are people. They do. They, they're not sedentary like oh, we are. A lot of them are. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, hi. My question is somewhat similar to uh, Winston. Um, I wanted to just kind of figure out if you, if the relationship between African Americans and the trauma that many of us have suffered historically and the disease. That's a whole nother topic, kind of off the, the, the topic what we're going to talk about today. I will just say, yes, there is a connection, but it's out of the scope of the talk and the topic I have today. But thank you for the question. Okay. Move on. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right. So now, what, let's talk about some of what he was bringing up. What is a plant-based diet? So just what it sounds like. A diet that is predominantly based on plants, things that come from the ground. Fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, certain oils, whole grains, and legumes, which are your beans and peanuts. See, I do want to take a moment, though, to just differentiate between vegan and veganism and plant-based because those terms are used interchangeably and they kind of mean the same thing, but not quite. So when someone describes themselves as vegan or uh, living a veganism lifestyle, those are people who only eat plant-based. Whereas someone who has a plant-based diet may eat chicken or fish occasionally, a, ve a vegan or a, ve a person who is vegan uh, describes, subscribes to veganism will only eat plant-based. And they also don't wear things like leather or even um, silk because it's made by by worms, or use honey in their in their foods because it's made by bees, and they also may not even go to things like zoos and aquariums because those are um, seen as harmful to animals. So 
when I talk now to people, I turn, tend to use the more the term more plant based because veganism really does have um, a more strict or finite um, definition. Next slide. So why is it important? Why do we talk about eating the rainbow or eating more fruits and vegetables? Because studies suggest that people who do eat a plant-based diet tend to live longer. They live longer, they look better typically, or they, you know, they feel better, but that's what I mean by that. Um, and it's also shown that they have decreased risk of some of the diseases that we've talked about, the obesity, the heart disease, the diabetes, certain types of cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, the endometrial cancer. Some of these cancers have been linked to, to what we eat, to lifestyle, to being obese. So this is why this is important. Next slide. So now we're going to talk about the rainbow. Okay, so if you know when you go to the grocery store, you go to the produce aisle, right? You see all these different colors, right? Those colors in your food are healthy chemicals. You know, we used to say don't don't do don't eat chemicals. You want to minimize, but those are actually plant based or phytonutrients we call them, and those different colors represent or or have a different certain benefits in your body when you eat them. So we're going to go through the rainbow, and you're going to see some of this again. It's going to be a little repetitive because they all work together. Um, but this hopefully kind of gets you thinking the next time you go to your produce aisle. So when you see red foods like tomatoes, for example, those are going to be rich in lycopene, which is in the vitamin A family. And the health benefits of those, all of these are going to be anti-inflammatory, antioxidants. And what that means is they help to repair the tissues in your body. You know, you're, we're under assault every day, our bodies, from pollution, from ultraviolet light, from the sun, radiation, um, you know, cigarette smoke, all those things change our cells on a, on a microscopic and, and, and smaller level. So anti-inflammatories and antioxidants help to repair some of that damage from happening. So foods in this category are good for your heart. They also can help with skin damage from the sun. And they, again, can relate, uh, lower the risk of certain cancers. So now we'll look at some of what, some of these foods as a, as a representation. Next slide. So you've got, and this is, you know, I don't have everything on here, but it's some of the more common ones. Cranberries, red onions, beets, bell peppers, red lentils, kidney beans, and of course, occasional glass of red wine. So all of these, by adding them to your diet in some form or another, gives you that variety. And we eat with our eyes first. So when you have all these beautiful colors on your plate, it just looks more appetizing for one thing. But then you also know that you're getting the benefits of these foods. Next slide. Next, we'll look at purple foods. So the main phytonutrient or chemical there are the anthocyanins. Again, anti-inflammatory, antioxidants. Also help with your heart benefits. These may also help uh, protect your brain as well. So decrease the risk of neurologic disorders, may lower the risk of type 2 diabetes, as well as certain cancers. And so here we have purple cauliflower. So I don't know about your grocery stores. I can never find purple cauliflower by grocery store, but this is like a farmer's market kind of thing, right? So we're getting into that season of farmer's market. Check out some of the new, the, the, the different versions of your favorite or common foods and, and try them out. One of those being purple cauliflower. We've got some blueberries, blackberries, which I've recently discovered. I love. Go figure. Um, you've got red or kale. So that's a different version of kale to try. Purple carrots, eggplants, of course. Um, and purple asparagus, which I've actually never seen, but would love to try some. And then purple sweet potatoes. Purple sweet potatoes are not just purple on the outside. If you've never had them, they're actually purple throughout. So it's pretty, it's pretty good. If you've never had one, I highly recommend them. And then, of course, purple cabbage. So next slide. So, of course, green foods. So the main phyto, phytonutrients there are going to be chlorophyll and um, carotenoids and your leafy greens. And then your cruciferous greens like broccoli and cabbage, uh, Brussels sprouts. Those are going to have indoles. Isothiocyanates and glucose states. Basically, again, still all anti-inflammatory, antioxidants, and decrease the risk of cancer and heart disease. 
So tons of options here. We, we can you know, name these all day. Lettuce, Swiss chard, arugula. Don't forget your herbs count too, right? So your, your herbs that are green count in this category too. Um, grapes, limes, avocado, packed with your healthy fats, omega-3s. Um, celery, which is, you know, celery, cucumber, those are hydrating. So during the summer when you're, you know, want to make sure you're staying hydrated, think about celery and cucumber, you can add that to, you know, to um, whatever food you're making that they go with. Uh, of course, turn of greens, like green apples, things like that. Next slide. Next, we have yellow and orange foods. So the main beneficial uh, phytonutrients here are the <laughs> retinoids, which are your beta carotene, alpha carotene, and these all are in the vitamin A family. They also benefit your heart. These are good for your eyes as well, and may also lower certain cancer risks as well. So for yellow foods, we've got yellow peppers, bananas, jackfruit. Jackfruit is a, a big, um, for those who are plant-based, it's, a, it's a commonly used as a meat replacement. So it can be used to make like a, a faux barbecue, for a pulled pork or fish cakes, things like that. Uh, golden beets, which are, I think, a little sweeter than red beets. Uh, and then yellow cauliflower as well, mango and pineapple. Next slide. And then for orange foods, of course, you know, the common ones, um, carrots, pumpkin, apricots. Turmeric um, is a great spice to have on hand. Uh, if you can get it fresh, they're fine. If not, powdered works well, too. Uh, just be careful that it does stay. Uh, it can cause your, your fingers to turn yellow briefly. Um, sweet potatoes, tangerines, a few more up there. So I just want to give you, um, you know, we've talked about the doom and gloom, you know, the, the scary statistics, uh, African-Americans being at higher rate, at high risk. But I also just wanted to leave you with some ideas for how you can start to control the things you can control. You know, there are risk factors that you can't change, your family history, your gender, your age, what have you. But the things you put on your plate, the amount of exercise you get, those are things that you can control, working with your doctor if need be. And so I just wanted to give you some, some ideas on ways you can incorporate these things either new or use them in different ways. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you for this. Gary has a first question. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Got here a couple of minutes later. Nice presentation. You look great this morning. Um, my question to you is, are you aware of all the deception that goes on in the food industry? Um, my brother mentioned overseas. She mentioned market. But... This country sells a lot of products that are illegal overseas. When you walk in the store, this section says organic. What's the rest of the store? Um, the picture looks great. And I'll just stop there because you shook your head and said you was aware. But they program you and deceive you based on the words. Plant based. They show a picture with all the plants. Nice colors, looks good, healthy. But don't forget that building with the smoke coming out of it is also a plant. I do a lot of research, so um, you answered my question. I made my statement. Thank you. Okay, do you want me to respond? Go ahead. Oh, so a couple of things you touched on, um, which I think are a great point. Number one, you said organic, and I'm glad you said that because it reminds me to say this. There are certain words that when you see it on a package, if you're in the store, you, 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 I don't think people want to not be healthy. It's not that people want to go out and eat bad food all the time, right? So the industries know that, and they market to that. So you'll see words that say natural or organic or sugar-free, low-fat, gluten-free. And you may think that these are all healthy and good for you. But not necessarily. You can, you can be vegan and eat poorly. You can have something that's organic. I mean, sugar can be organic. So, you know, you're not going to just eat that by the, you know, cupful. So you have to know what these words mean and how to interpret labels, which is a whole other conversation or presentation. Um, 
your fact about um, there's a lot of deception. I agree with you. I, I don't think that the obesity epidemic happened because a whole bunch of people just got not to exercise and not eat right. There's if you if you go through history, you can see with certain additives that things were added to the foods because it made them cheaper, it prolonged their life. And that's when certain problems started increasing obesity, chronic diseases. There's no coincidence there. I, a quick story. I used to, I had a practice in Memphis. And um, I took care of a lot of military families. And so one day, the mom, uh, mom brings her, 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 I think she was 12-year-old daughter. And they had been in Japan for like the past two years. And the mom was concerned because her 12-year-old girl still looked like a boy. She had no curves, no hips, nothing. And I, you know, took a history like you do as a doctor, make sure there's nothing else going on. And I said, ma'am, your daughter is normal. So where have y'all been for the past year? She said, Japan. I said, your daughter looks the way she does because she hasn't been over here eating all this hormone and antibiotic rich foods that our kids get over here. So I said, you know, let's, let's just watch her. We don't need to do anything. She has a couple more years before we start getting concerned that she's not hitting puberty on time. So, yes, I definitely believe that, that there is. I mean, you, you know, all you have to do is look at our young ladies nowadays. Right. Like when I, I'm 52 years old, we didn't, I didn't go to school with girls who look like that at those ages. So there's, there's no coincidence there. And then just one last thing I do want to add is um, in regards to additives and preservatives, I've done some research on that. It was very interesting. So the FDA is supposed to be over all of that stuff. There, when it all kind of first started, when those, when those products first started coming into the food phase, they were researching. They would, they would do their due diligence to say it was safe or not safe. But with the explosion of processed foods, the FDA essentially got overwhelmed. And the FDA means? Food and Drug Administration. What's the middle word? Drug. Okay, contention. Right, but the first word is food. I know. Okay. Here. <laughs> so. I'm sorry, Angela. Radio with me. I'm sorry. So they um, they they came up with a term called GRAS, generally recognized as safe, and that's a large category of these food additives or preservatives fall into that category. And who's overseeing that? The food manufacturers. The FDA allows the food manufacturers to say if their additives or preservatives are safe. Hmm, there can be. There's no problem there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, you have to be an educated consumer. But at the end of the day, a plant, plant as in coming from the ground, not with the smokestack, because I've never heard that before. I like that. Okay. Um, yes, that's going to be better for you. It's a no brainer. So, that's all I'm here to just bring that awareness to you. Thank you for your, for your comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question, and then um, Jackie. And uh, what I try to do is try not to have processed food because that's where you see those problems. Exactly. You know? um, my question is, how much does cooking affect those vegetables? Great question. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Depends on how you cook it. Because again, you can have healthy, you can start off healthy, right? Collard greens. I'm about to step on some toes. <laughs> So oh, you got your, I got your, you got your steel toe shoes on today because we're about to step on some toes. We overcook our coffees, generally speaking, mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I'm guilty of this too because I was raised, you know, <laughs> the coffee beans got to have that, they got to have that, that glisten to them, they got to have that texture. But the longer you cook foods, yes, generally going to cook out most of the nutrients. Yep. Microwaving is actually a good way to cook because it's short. I mean, it sounds counterintuitive, like microwaving. I'm not saying you should microwave all of your food, but microwaving certain foods can actually be a healthier way to, to cook them. Steaming, um, wok, cooking in the wok, where you're kind of, you know, you, you get the food in, it's cooked quickly, and, and it's not um, overcooked. So, you know, your, your vegetables shouldn't be limp. You know, your vegetables should have some bite, some crisp to them, some crunch. Um, and <laughs> But yeah, but that's that's a great question. The way you, you cook your food is it does definitely play um, you know, low heat cooking things over low heat, we know that high heat, that's why process, that's why things like, you know, barbecue ribs and hamburgers, that stuff cooked on the grill where you get the, that char that everyone likes, those that's actually thought to be carcinogenic. 
meaning you can increase your risk of cancer. So cooking things at lower temperatures, um, judicious use of oils, certain oils can become harmful when they're cooked at high temperatures. So all those things do, do play a role. Okay, um, Jackie and then Laura. Yes, so, somewhat off of the um, food. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself early years? We, we got, you know, sure. those kinds of things. Thank you. So yeah, no problem. Um, I'm from New York. Are you? Boston. Okay, I heard, I heard Northeast. Um, native New Yorker, born in the Bronx. I've been in Charlotte um, since 1996. I did my residency at CMC, CMC which is now HM. Um, let's see what else can I tell you. I'm uh, after finishing medical school, I practiced here in Charlotte for several years and moved to Memphis and then the cousins have come back. Um, but yeah, I just for me, I kind of got on this path as far as physician in the kitchen. Um, you know, I, I mentioned some of my accolades, but the biggest the turning point for me, one of the turning points was listening to my grandmother at a young age, she was only 67, and we lost her to complications of hypertension, obesity, and smoking. Um, she suffered a massive stroke and died two days later. And so that combined with caring for patients, trying to coach them on how to be healthier. And I didn't learn this stuff in med school. Now, in med school, we didn't, we didn't learn this. So I had to go back and learn some of this stuff to educate and be able to bring this to, to you all. So that's kind of how I got to where I am today. Did you have another question? Okay, no, I'm not, uh, Laura, okay. she's next. I'll call on you, Laura. Yeah. Um, my question is about juice. Can you elaborate a bit about uh, juicing a step in the videos and smoothies? Like smoothies with juice and plant based juice and smoothies. Can you talk about how you, you your perception of that? Your recommendation? Yeah, that's a good question. If you didn't hear, she's asking about juicing versus um, smoothies. Uh, smoothies are probably going to be better for you because you're getting the whole. You're, you're eating the whole food item. Whereas juicing, you're just getting the juice. So you're losing a lot of the fiber um, from the pulp. So, because, like, for example, apples, a lot of the benefits to apples are actually in the skin of the apple. So, anything where you're going to gain the whole food is going to be better for you. So, I would give a bigger thumbs up to um, a smoothie versus, but it, and then also depends what else you put in with the smoothie. So if you're getting, you know, if you wanted to low fat, low sugar, milks and things like, and juices, things like that. But um, yeah, juicing, you're you're kind of wasting a lot of that. Now, unless you're going to use that, the pulp. Some people will take what they've um, the leftover and add it to like a zucchini bread or something like that. You know, you can repurpose some of that stuff. But in general, if you're just juicing, you're going to lose a lot of the benefits of that whole food. Better than nothing, but you're not going to get a full benefit. Okay. Uh, Ken, and then. I heard someone once say everything in moderation. And it's the excess that really takes us under. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a diabetic, I saw in those, uh, in the rainbow, I saw some things that my dietitian would tell me uh, don't eat too many grapes because of the natural sugars. Corn is a natural sugar. Mm -hmm. goes with, but my question is more. About the herbs that you talked about, uh, can you speak to the benefit of smoking herbs? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> oh my goodness! But I do want to say something you did say, and I should. I usually do a disclaimer. Of course, this is not meant to diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. What I'm telling you is general comments that, of course, you would speak to your doctor or dietitian about your health about. But thank you for that part of your comment. Plant based. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I know we we have we always have such a good time when we have our uh, guest here, but let's let's keep our decorum, okay? <laughs> I'm not talking about you, and I'm not talking about anybody. No, it is a good. I'm not talking about you. Love you, Mary. <laughs> okay, wait a minute, Natalie. I'm going to move on to, you have a question. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. So are you saying, even though you didn't say it, we should not eat meat, we should not eat red meat? That's number one. And number two, if we should stay away from meats, do you and your publications prescribe the appropriate foods we should have for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner? If you're interested in protein and things like that. I mean, do you prescribe, if you assume it's plant-based all the way, what should our breakfast have in it? What should our lunch have in it? 
What should our dinner have? Good question. I don't tell anyone they shouldn't eat meat. I don't eat red meat. That's my decision. The research shows that red meat is more can be more harmful than beneficial. So no, if you ask me, I'm going to say I'm, I'm going to recommend a more plant based diet. But that's for the person to decide. As far as what you should eat for breakfast and lunch and dinner, you know, you want to have a, a complete meal. So if you the um, there's something called the healthy plate. Um, which I think was put out think, by the American Dietary Association. Don't quote me on that. So if you take an average size plate, which is about nine inches, seven for adults is nine, seven for children, or if you want to lose weight, you can use a seven inch. About half of that plate should be your uh, vegetables, your non-starchy vegetables. About a quarter of the plate would be your protein. It can be animal-based or it can be plant-based, like, uh, you know, um, Tofu or seitan or tempeh, things like that. And then the last quarter is going to be your carbs. So that can be your, your bread or your grains that are high in carbs. So your meal should be roughly, you know, some type of some source of fat, a little bit of healthy fat, some protein, some carbs, and various amounts, depending on what your goals are and whatever your health concerns are. And, and you can get all that through plant-based food. Yes. You don't need animals to you get don't have to, No. You know, there's a big myth that you have to eat meat to get protein. That's that's not true. There's I mean some of the biggest animals on the planet, elephants, you know, bison, whales. <laughs> they don't eat they don't eat well, I don't, I don't know if whales eat. But on the on land bearing land animals, um, they don't eat meat. They're huge. So no, you can you can definitely get it with a plant based diet. Okay, um, Winston and then Jackie. Yes, uh, I got a two part question. So, one is uh, the without first, a lot of commentary, please. Okay. okay. Uh, the first question is what are some of those kind of foods in the plant based diet that could be present more of an illusion of health? For example, like I, I my doctor told me one time uh, a handful of grapes isn't too far away from a handful of Skittles. So I, I, where, where the sugars are, you know, uh, that might not have a lot of nutritional value to accompany it. And also, uh, what do you see, like, how, is this a world approach to, like, plant-based diet? For example, like, Bedouin people who live in the desert or Inuit people who live in icy Alaska, how would they approach plant-based diets when they have very finite food sources? Okay, I'm gonna answer the second question first. I think my talk was U.S. I talked about the U.S. I can't right. speak to what people are doing right. wherever they are. You know, I I don't know how those people would, would adapt to this. Um, but the first part of your question, um, you mentioned grapes and sugar. If you're diabetic, and there's something called the glycemic index, so that's a number where when you eat something, how high does your sugar go within an hour or so after you eat? Yes, there are going to be certainly some foods that spike that number much higher than other foods. So working with a doctor and a dietitian can help get you a more tailored approach to what you should be eating. Generally speaking, these foods are going to be healthier for you. But again, how you cook them, how you prepare them, salads are healthy when they start off, right? If you just have lettuce and tomato and some toppings, by the time you put on the ranch dressing and the bacon bits and the cheese... <laughs> And the croutons, not so much. So it's really everything in moderation, I heard, how you prepare it. And if you do have certain health conditions, like, like people with irritable bowel and, and celiac disease can't eat certain proteins. They're, they're natural and they're healthy, but people with those conditions can't eat them. So if you have certain limitations, you know, physical issues with foods, that's something that you would want to have a tailored approach for. Okay, uh, Jackie. Yes, I want, I want to circle back around. You you gave us your background, I think, like from going to New York schools, and then you did residency at Carolina's Medical, but there a little bit more. I think oh, in, in between there. I went but, but, my, but my question, Mary, if, if I can, is that BMI. I mean, there, there are some folks who are like it. 25 and 25.1, and you're then overweight. Okay, so sorry, I think I left out. I went to Chapel Hill and Matar Hill, 
I'm not going to talk about basketball right now. <laughs> um, but that's why I went to college and then I went to med school at Temple um, in Philadelphia. Yes, as I mentioned in my presentation, BMI is a rough guide. Okay. For the average person, it's going to be, it's helpful because, you know, most people are not muscle bound bodybuilders. Right. And so it's a rough guide. Um, it's a tool that we use as physicians to gauge where people are, but there's also a waist circumference that can be more helpful, which is where we just measure your waist for around your belly button. Um, if it's more than 40 inches in men, 35 inches in women, that could, that's actually can be more harmful because we know we're measuring adiposity, fat around your organs, which increases the risk for these cancers and all these other things. So that number would be used in addition to a BMI. Um, there's other measurements that we can use, but no, it's a rough guide. It's not meant for everyone. Uh, everyone should not be a, you know, 22. That's not what we're saying, but it is a way to help to assess patients, particularly if they have these other health conditions. You know, if your BMI is 27, which is technically overweight, okay. You know, but you work out, you, you eat a fairly healthy diet, you don't smoke, you know, those things, it's the whole picture that they're going at. Okay, um, Laura and then Ken. I'd just like to, for you to just give us an idea, just uh, as it relates to the meals, as the gentleman had asked earlier, like, um, tell us, you know, what's a typical good Breakfast. nutritional breakfast and a good nutrition for three or four items you know okay. can you just share that with us sure i'll tell you what i eat is that okay that's 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 cool okay so um for breakfast i don't like oatmeal i have texture issues i don't like the way oatmeal feels so if you yeah. like oatmeal go for it i do quinoa quinoa is a cereal a uh, pseudo cereal it's a grain it's got the nine essential uh, amino acids in it uh, I make that with some a little bit of cocoa. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like chocolate quinoa. It tastes like little chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. it's, it's delicious. My son loves it. Um, if I want toast or avocado, you know, avocado toast. Yeah, and avocado's got the healthy fats in it. Um, if I want a source of protein, I may have a plant-based um, sausage. Um, I don't eat those as much because those are processed. But if I do want like a sausage patty, that's what I'll have. I make my own seitan, which is a um, another meat replacement. If you have gluten issues, you can't use that. Um, You're good. For lunch, I'll have, you know, pasta, rice. You know, trying to do whole grain pastas, brown rice. Um, I've got some cauliflower steak. That's my latest kick that I'm on. Um, use a head of cauliflower and cut it into steaks. And then just grill it. And then uh, baste it in some vegan gravy. Delicious. Um those are just some of the favorites I, I like. I mean, I, you know, lots of different vegetables can be made in different ways. So um, stuffed bell peppers, stuffed with, with, with quinoa, with rice, or lentils. Lentils are, are huge. Lentils and beans are great staples to have in your pantry. They're cheap. The shelf life is long. And they can be cooked in a variety of ways. And they're excellent sources of protein. So a question about protein. So. Um, I want to say, too, that since I'm trying to be low on salt, um, a lot of the canned tomatoes and canned beans have no salt labels on them. So that's something too. Um, Gary and then Ken. My only question, you mentioned the cereal. Well, I guess you said it's not like, you, you, did you mention those few ingredients and, and what's, you said cocoa, so, what, what is the liquid that's with it? Oh, yeah. Um, either I use plant based milk, like almond milk or oat milk. Okay. Well, you can do it with water, but they tend to think it would have to be milk. Okay. Um, it's actually a recipe in my, in my cookbook. Um, but I use yeah, uh, the cocoa powder, exactly. I use a little bit of maple, sugar, maple syrup, and sugar, and some vanilla. How do I get the cookbook? I have some of my partners. Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ken. And actually, can you go to the next slide? You go to the next slide. The next time, because I've got some information. So this is just my information. Before I oh, actually one more, thank you. This is my information on how to stay connected with me. I'm on social media, physician in the. Oh, sorry about that. Physician in the kitchen. Um, 
those are some of the services I offer there. And then the book is Doc Fix My Plate. You can send you kitchen prescriptions for your healthy meal makeover. It has over 50 plant-based recipes. It also talks about a little bit about my journey toward a more plant-based diet. I started this in 2020. Uh, I turned 50 in May of 2020 and um, had to have the whole Zoom birthday party as opposed to what I was planning to do. And uh, also just got me thinking about how do I want to step into the next half of my century and really look more toward um, a plant-based diet. So these recipes are a combination of just my experience plus my training in culinary school. Um, and then it also has tips and tricks on how to set up a vegan pantry, how to substitute things like butter, eggs, um, milk, and then also some of my favorite kitchen gadgets because I'm a kitchen gadget junkie. And so just a little bit of everything. So that's, okay. that's my speed. Uh, Ken? You didn't answer one of my other questions, so let me give you another one not to answer. But uh, yeah. <laughs> we know police profiling. Uh, so do doctors or from your experience, when a doctor sees two physiques like me and radio walk in, and then you see a physique like my good friends can walk in, uh, which of the three of us you go, oh, no, I need to have some more diabetes. <laughs> or, oh, welcome. Welcome. I'm going to say, as a physician, I look forward to seeing Thank you. almost all of my patients, but not the patients who say, no, not for that reason. Um, I'm going to see a little more work as far as the music. <laughs> Oh, but no, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's job security. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it like that, but I mean, you can do more for people. I'm blunt. Um, I'll answer that for you. <laughs> but no, but it's, it's we, we see it as we, you know, we see you, number one, you're as a, as a person, and then how can I help this person in whatever they have, and whether it's diabetes, mental health, whatever it is. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and I just, I just want to say this just as a point of personal privilege. Um, my daughter is a um, medical director over at Concentra, and they, they worked together uh, before. So, we yes. sure did. <laughs> so, they know each other. And, um, but um, we want to thank you so much for coming. Let's give her a big hand. Thank you. I stopped about five minutes early because if you're going to, if anybody wants to get a book, yeah. I think they're going to have a chance to get a book before you um, get out. I appreciate of here. that. She has to leave at 9 30. Yeah. And if you want to stay, we can sort of have a, um, we can have an open forum where we can talk. So, so do you, oh yeah, so Ken is going to go get, he's going to help me, yes. Okay, you he's, go he's, get him. He's, yeah, he's got a down pat. Yeah, can't buy a book in this room. I was no, it's a government building. You can go out. Just go out to her car. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. When she leave, when she when she's gonna get out of here in a few minutes. Yeah. And uh, do you want to do it now? Um, or you want to wait to write it, man? Oh no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So um, tomorrow the facilitators are going to have um, a small retreat. I think it's tomorrow, right? Yeah. yeah. And so we're going to be talking about ideas to make our forum even better. I think, Jackie, you said it perfectly one time, and I can't remember your exact words about our, our retreat, but um, we just want you to know that we're always looking for ways to improve, ways to um, make this forum even better, and maybe even get more people to actually come in person. You know, when we've had... We've talked about different ways to get people to come in person. You know, people love the um, Zoom now. We need to come Zoom edits. Are you inviting me to the retreat? No. no. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'd love to go. <laughs> Can I Zoom it? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is just okay. for just You know, I always have something to say. You I do, mean, you do. And you I'll be, I mean, but you want to, you know. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> I just like to say that um, we're inviting everybody to come back on April the 4th. Steve Crump has done a documentary on the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King that he will be presenting on April the 4th. And 
we will have some of the people that knew Dr. King to be panelists. Uh, and thanks to Ken, a uh, connection with Steve Trump that this is occurring. Oh, that's good. And it's a 26 that's minute good. documentary on the fourth, that's the anniversary, 1968, of the death of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. But that will be here in Tuesday Forum on the fourth day. So you all come back. Yeah. And, and on, I haven't set the exact date yet, but um, the digital navigators are going to be here because we um, they're giving um, computers to um, people, you know, free computers and um, setting up um, internet service for people. So they're going to be uh, doing that. They did one last Saturday and Ken. Well, for the computer, sir. They give me five computers that they know how to use it. Well, that's that's part of what they do. That's part of what they do. But uh, you don't walk out of there without with that computer well, until you learn how to use it. It's a they they don't just hand it to you. I should get about something for that. So well, but, they give uh, you some paperwork. Oh, <laughs> can you read? I want <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I wanted to suggest when you all go into your uh, retreat, mm -hmm. and I've said this consistently. And uh, I ain't listening, but I'm going to say it again. Okay. Two things sell. Two things sell in media. And two things draw attraction of, of, of viewers, subscribers. Sex and controversy. And as long as you all sit here and damn your family alone, you're going to get the same result. And if you want to really draw a Different audience and bigger audience to get more people like Winston, young people. Because that's, that's the future of our favorite. But do you have any ideas about getting the young people? We'll, we'll put you, you'll be yeah, the one person for that. Like <laughs> but, you know, when people, have, people throw out ideas, I like to make them the point person for that. Okay, I'll get, I'll get a sex therapist the next week. <laughs> We have some bad things. Okay, Carly, as far as the I always said I need bad language. So um, I would love to have that. But the other day, your husband was at the um, presentation. Thanks. Yeah. The, the, other, the other thing was I talked with um, Dean Boyd, yeah. um, head of the Board oh, of yeah. Trustees, and he's willing to talk to us many times. That we, uh, you know, we just need to give them. Uh, could you get a date? Could you get a date? If you guys get some dates, I'll present it to We can do it. We can and I'll keep thinking about April. We'll know tomorrow. Which, um, they need to reach on the end of April. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then let me just say something about uh, I agree with you, Ken, as far as. Um, Getting people who are young, I think we should lift them up. But let us never forget that as old as I am, I can run circles around you and never leave my feet. So don't forget those who are elder. Yeah. Oh. Real quick, mention to Ken, food too. <laughs> food was taken off of the title of this forum. People love food. Go to cookouts. We ain't even been there five minutes. We already fixed it. Take on the plate. That's because when it started, it was breakfast. You know, because they were here, McDonald's happened here, but we don't. It, it's but different. If, if, if the sponsors, because it's always a tax write off, if they had something to nibble on for, for 25 to 40 people, simple, they throw more of that away at the end of the day. You know what? Well, we're gonna take that to the retreat, okay? Please we'll take, do so. I can't. I can't. I'm just gonna take it to the retreat. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, my I, I want to announce that on next Tuesday, the twenty-first, um, the program will be um, RN. I'm your RN for persons in healthcare, not doctors, <laughs> nurses. Um, and on the 28th, it will be um, attorneys, women attorneys, and this is completing our women district. Okay, next month, next week, 
Next week it's going to be RNs. On the 28th, it's going to be attorneys. Pioneer attorneys. Everything's pioneer. This is so important. I hope that we get the word out. I know it goes out as an email. I mean, it goes out as an email blast, but you all also have your own networks of emails. So let's see if we can get this out. Okay, any other, anybody else want to comment on anything? Well, have a good day. Okay, <laughs> wonderful day. Dr. Uh, May is out in the, in the parking uh, lot. Parking lot. I can't I can't